everybody. Welcome to another live stream picture value podcast. Today I'm joined by Linwood Jackson Jr. And today we're going to be discussing the theology and also the historical Paul. So welcome back to the podcast, Linwood. Yeah, thank you. Last time you had me here, I ended on a note where Paul was the main subject, and I just wanted to touch back on that. Yeah. So what do you think about Paul? What what is it that you think he believes about Jesus? What is he doing? What's his goals? I um I'll start from from the beginning because I believe that there are multiple well there are multiple Pauls. Uh there's a Paul in the book of Acts that is not the same Paul from the Galatians and the Paul from the book of Acts and the Paul in the Galatians isn't the same Paul from the Romans the Thessalonians. So there's different Pauls. And I guess I'll I'll start from I guess the historical sense. Um, I'll move into doctrine. I'll move into how that breaks down, and then I'll see if I can round it out, because Paul's a very, uh, very complicated individual, and especially factoring in, I will also talk about the, the the two doctrines that he has. When you factor in the two philosophies that that Paul has the philosophy that is blatant in, in the Galatians, and then the philosophy that is blatant in the Philippians and the, and the Colossians, and then the philosophy that sort of mixes the two in the Romans into the, in, in, to the Corinthians, also the Thessalonians. There's different Pauls, there's two different doctrines, and I'll start by just getting into the person um, and all of this coming from research research uh, from analyzing the, the way that the Bible breaks down characters and the way that the Bible breaks down uh, words, uh, systems, and processes in order to get the dialect or the frame of what that reference may be according to the context of how it is given. So you have Paul, uh, our, our introduction to him is an introduction that is uh, mirroring the same introduction of the Balaam, the prophet. So it's the same story. Uh, writer um, traveling to, to curse uh, the people of God is thrown off, uh, sees a vision, uh, has a revelation, uh, comes to some clearance in himself. And it's the same story when it comes to Paul or how we're introduced to Paul in that same manner. And I think that's important because the Bible's making an analogy between characters and that Balaam is understood um, historically and, and within the Bible to be a false prophet, to be uh, someone that is not reliable when it comes to trusting on the words of, their, of the God of, of Israel and someone that is an actual enemy to the philosophy and to the people of Israel. And I believe the author of the book, the book of Acts uh, has an agenda and that agenda from the first chapter until the last is to make associations in order to give distinct fact, even though it's not so clear and even, even though it's hidden. And so the, the character of Paul having this same story of Balaam written about him and written for him, I believe that the author of the book of Acts is allowing us to know that this character is synonymous with the same character or the, the same disposition of Balaam and that he's a false prophet. Um, and I say that because not just of what I'll get into is philosophy, but the only other person that has an, a very blatant issue with the, the, the movement, the new, relig the new Jewish religious movement, is, is the author says Herod. Herod has the same disdain for this religious movement as does Paul. And what's interesting about that, what's interesting about that is that Paul is supposedly supposed to have been taught by Gamaliel. And when you hear, there's not really much about this, this, this character, but the, the little snippet that we have of him, when there's a, a discussion about to get, to get rid of this new group, what do we do about them? We need, to, we need to vanquish them. We can't let them live anymore. Gamaliel is actually the voice of reason. He's actually the voice that says, well, wait a minute, how about you remember what happened to this movement, and then you remember what happened to that movement, and then we see that the outcome of that movement is the result of either God working for them or God not working for them. 
So if this movement is actually for God, well, we can't get in the way of it. It cannot be stopped. And if, if it is not for God, God himself will take care of it himself. So let's let them be. Let's leave them alone. Now, this is the philosophy of Gamaliel. This is not the spirit that Paul has, <laughs> which allows me to understand that the, the connection between the two is actually a false connection. And if it was, um, I don't understand how Paul could have gotten so deep into the hierarchy of the Jews with such a uh, temperament, a logical one, when the Sanhedrin at that point in time is very meticulous and careful uh, with what they do, whether it be their thought and feeling. So Paul having the same disposition of Herod, Paul having the contra a contrary spirit to his supposed teacher, allows me to know that the author, of the, uh, the author of the book of Acts knows more about Paul than they are letting on in their, their dialogue or their narrative. Having the same story of Balaam, uh, the same disposition of Herod, and having the, a, a character that is contrary to his supposed teacher, reading this, this is the way that the Bible articulates narrative within narrative, and how the Bible speaks what is unspoken. And what is, what is unspoken is that Paul has, according to the author, uh, the same disposition of Balaam, which is to betray the movement of the supposed people of God. And I believe this to be true. I believe this to be true because of what Paul uh, laments on Paul is building off of an already established framework. He's building off of um, actually two established frameworks. And I'll say two because one, there is a scene where Paul is um, correcting an individual, uh, Bar Jesus. And this Bar Jesus, he curses. And the curse that he puts on this Bar Jesus, it says that after this curse, Bar Jesus arose and was blind and had to be carried off and had to, all this had to happen to him. Well, the same thing actually happened to Paul. Paul was actually made blind. Paul was actually, Paul actually needed to be carried away just like that same individual had to be carried away. So again, the Bible is using uh, illustration for analogy to let us know that there is not an actual, this mysterious sighting that he had and falling off. That's, that's not true. What I believe to be true is that what Paul did to that individual, because that individual actually shares the same experience that Paul shared, I actually believe, and I think that the author of the, the book of Acts is letting us know that the same putting on of the hands that Paul did for that bar Jesus, this is the same putting on of the hands that, that Paul had happened to him. So I believe that the same, because the effect is the same, it's the same experience, but the same experience won't be relayed because the author wants us to understand the connection between characters within the scripture. Just as Matthew says, um, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus had to go to um, Egypt and then had to come back. And then it says, I have, I've given, I've rescued my son from, from Egypt. The author's making that same analogy to show that this is a very credible thing that we're writing about because it's filling in the gap. It's associating with what happened in the past. Um, the, the Herod um, slaying of children, uh, which is not historically factual, that, that did not happen in history. But what did happen was King Alexander Janaeus, the king of the Hasmonean dynasty, actually slaughtered 800 Pharisees. And some of those Pharisees that were slaughtered actually traveled from Jerusalem and escaped from the land of the Jews and escaped and went into Egypt. So that's how that story of, fle of fleeing during a slaughter from the land of the Jews into Egypt takes place. It's a real story, but the authors have fabricated it. And they're using these things to make the connections there so that we can, so that the reader, the sincere reader can understand the underlying motive behind them doing this for the exchanging of characters, for the exchanging of settings, for the exchanging of context, for the fact of allowing the character given in that exchange to be the same. So no matter what we see with Balaam and Paul, it's the same character because the story is the same. No matter what we see of Bar Jesus and Paul, it's the same character because the characters are the same. 
the experience is the same. The same thing that Paul did in that same experience that Bar Jesus had, Paul had the same experience happen to him. And that's why there's so much of this Ananias and, and all of this that happens to him, scales falling from his eyes. This is figurative language showing that his eyes, Paul lets us know in the book of Ephesians 1 and 18, that eyes are a figurative illustration for the mind or for understanding. He says the eyes of your understanding in the book of Ephesians 1 18. So when it's saying that scales f- fell from his eyes, it's really his understandings were coming to light by an already established framework. So Paul was taught, contrary to what he says in the Galatians, I was not taught this by man, but by revelation. In one sense, that's true. I'll talk about that. But in another sense, it's false. Because Paul received his understanding and his enlightening from somebody putting their hands on him. And that putting on of hands in the Bible means the exchanging of wisdom and understanding. So Paul received his doctrine from a Damascus-based, quote-unquote, Jesus movement. From a Damascus-based Jesus movement. He also, and they also, received their framework from an already existing, quote-unquote, Jesus movement. Now, this Jesus movement did not, did not go to the, to the extent that Paul went to. This Jesus movement was strictly Jewish. This Jesus movement did not see a man as a deity, did not see the man as being conceived by a virgin. This, this, this Jesus movement, those books uh, prior to Matthew and, and above Malachi, they're missing, the Maccabees. They tell of a, a theology of resurrection by the creator at an, at an appointed time. So the Jews already have an established mythology and theology concerning what is to take place for resurrection and what is to take place uh, for them personally. But the way that this, this movement saw that saw their character, their Jesus character, they cut off at the resurrection because they saw that the resurrection was a symbol of what is supposed to take place inwardly. Uh, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, says the psalmist in Psalm 51. These people maintained that philosophy, and they saw that the, they, they believed he, he was a resurrected individual, but they saw that he was resurrected and taken to God for the same purpose that Enoch was taken, for the same purpose that Elijah was taken, uh, for the same purpose that Moses was not found, his body, for the same purpose that Elijah's, Elisha's bones continued to heal after he had died. They didn't see the man as a deity, but they classed him with this same category of legendary heroes. Their theology didn't involve a resurrected deity or resurrected demigod because they already had a philosophy on the creator resurrecting them. This philosophy of resurrection ending up into the Jewish religion due to their captivity in Persia, where Ahura Mazda, where they got this, where the chief god there is Ahura Mazda, they got this philosophy of resurrection at the end of the world from Ahura Mazda and applied it to themselves. So they have this, 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 this philosophy of, of resurrection and stuff, and they really don't have a need for a demigod or for a god to place a sort of scheme of resurrection on them because the creator will do it himself. What they saw in this resurrection was that they saw the, the prerequisites of resurrection. So a key part of Paul's philosophy is a key part of Greek uh, philosophical lore and literature, which is the concept of the virtuous sufferer. The concept of the virtuous sufferer. To this this initial Jesus movement, it is because he suffered virtuously for the cause of God that he was accounted to be worthy of resurrection. And so they saw that this, this worthiness was an inward practice to establish them at that point in time to prepare them for what he experienced so that they too can experience the same. So they, 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 there was no divinity in his blood. There was no um, high priest at the right hand. There was, there was none of that. There was no need for any of that because their theology and their mythology already had a high priest at their God's right hand existing ever since their God existed. 
So to admit another high priest at, at their God's right hand, well, it didn't make sense and it was blasphemous. So they cut that off, but Paul didn't. Paul went further. Paul went further because his mind wasn't strictly Jewish. You know, he's from Tarsus. And Tarsus is, is, is a great seaport. And in this great seaport of Tarsus, the main religion is, is the religion of Mithra or Mithra. And along with with scheme of other things, and along with Greek philosophical thought. Paul seeing um, this individual. He understood that the Jews looked for three types of uh, messiahs. The Jews looked for a, a prophet, which was Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise them up a prophet like unto you. You'll speak my words. They looked for a king priest. This is in Zechariah. He shall sit on his throne as a priest and shall rule the throne and build the temple as a priest. But then they looked for the prophet. They, the Jews also looked for a king priest. But the Jews also looked for, in their own literature, the suffering, virtuous servant. Now, this is the individual of where it says, him will I acknowledge who is of a broken heart and it trembleth at my words. He is of, of low esteem, and when we see him, there is no beauty. We, we counted him afflicted, smitten of God. His visage was more marred than the sons of men. So the theme, the theme here is that these the Jews look for three individual, however they showed up, they showed up, or they look for the three in one. Paul understanding what this movement was, was, was now about. And in, in, in my studies, I found that he connected that, that initial Jesus movement to the Greek philosophy of the suffering uh, servant, the virtuous sufferer. Paul saw this virtuous suffering servant. And this, this is what enlightened him that this is that Messiah. He suffered virtuously for the cause of God. Now it is because he suffered virtu virtuously for the cause of God that he was anointed with that spirit. And this is where you get into um, Paul's theology and, and the mythology that Paul creates because in Paul's mythology, in the Christian religion, and in all religions, there are, there's a trinity. Um, the Christian religion has the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, but this is not Paul's initial trinity. Paul lets us know in um, Colossians that he has a scheme that he calls the mystery. The mystery of God and of the Father and of Jesus Christ. And when reading Paul, when reading his letters, they have to be read according to how he is interpreting God, Father, Jesus Christ. Because God is not the Father. The Father is not God. Jesus Christ is not the Father. Jesus Christ is not God. God is independent. The Father is independent. Jesus Christ is independent. And this, this, this scheme of independence comes from, as I found from Philo, who started this. When Paul is seeing that the virtuous sufferer has been accounted worthy of, of God, who he's calling the Father, to receive his anointing, and that anointing being the Spirit of the Father. In Paul's mind, he's not looking at this from a, from a Jewish perspective, he's looking at this from a Greek perspective. And in the Greek perspective, that Spirit is now the Logos. Now the Logos, the Logos, Paul is maintaining the same philosophy of Philo, that the Logos is the Son of God. Shooting out from the Father, God the Father, the Logos is the Son of God, being the universal truth and the universal form of truth and speech emanating from the thought process of the Father. Paul has created a personage. Philo creates a personage for that, that universal speech as the begotten, the beloved, the only Son of the Creator God the Father. So when Paul sees this virtuous sufferer, and he sees this virtuous sufferer acknowledged by 
the Father. Keep in mind, this is not the God of the Old Testament. This is a new deity that, that Paul, based off of then Jewish religious philosophy, has invented. God the Father is an invention. When God the Father sees that this virtuous sufferer is suffering virtuously for his cause, he then anoints this virtuous sufferer with his spirit. And this spirit is the Logos. And this Logos is the Son of the Father. So the God, when he says the mystery of God and of the Father and of Jesus Christ, Paul is actually saying that his, his doctrine, his philosophy, it's based off of the, the, the motive of God, God the Son, the Logos, God the Father, and Jesus Christ. Now, once the Logos is in the suffering servant, now Paul does not have a divine, a divine Jesus born divine. Paul doesn't have his suffering servant divine at all. And I'll get into why. In Paul's theology, God the Father has seen the virtuous sufferer worthy out of everyone else at that time suffering for his cause, and, and for doing so, has, has, has allowed the Logos to enter into him, <coughs> entering into his son for a specific purpose. Now, the Logos, the son of God, is within the virtuous sufferer. Once the virtuous uh, sufferer has the son of God within him, now the son of God releases something into the, the, the virtuous sufferer. What is released into the virtuous sufferer is what is called, or what Paul calls, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So you've got the Father seeing his virtuous sufferer, sending his logos into that virtuous sufferer. And then once the logos is in that virtuous sufferer, the logos releasing the Holy Ghost or his spirit, its spirit, into the suffering servant. To Paul, the release of the Holy Ghost within this suffering servant ties that suffering servant back to the Logos and then back to the Father. So you have God the Father giving his son into the suffering servant and then, this, and then the Logos making that suffering servant his son by way of the passing of his seed, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, into the suffering servant. Now, this is Paul's theology. <clears throat> this is Paul's, this is, this is theology and mythology that Paul uses to justify his claim for the pronouncement of the man's blood being more than what it is. It is because of the flowing, um, Holy Ghost of the Logos within this man that allows Paul to pick up where the initial Jesus movement wouldn't go. So now Paul is seeing that this man's blood is worth more than what it is. And he's seeing that this man's blood being worth more than what it is because he has the essence of the Logos within him and the Logos within him working and that Logos being sent from the Father. When this individual dies, and then when this individual rises, having all of this within him, well, now there's a cosmic shift that has taken place. And this is where that, that the justification for the Logos within that suffering servant um, needs, needs, needs to be, because there's a cosmic shift that matters to the Father, and that needs to take place. One of the attributes of Gnosticism is that Gnosticism takes the, the God of the Old Testament to be the, the ultimate idiot, in that this, this God has created everything supposedly well, but when it comes to human beings, there has been a major failure in that the soul of the human being is encased 
within a body full of disruptions, keeping the soul from reaching what it needs to reach due to the argument between the body and the soul. And most likely the, la the, the larger argument of the body winning over the higher faculties of, of the soul's higher intelligence, keeping the body or keeping the individual uh, fastened on their lower faculties and their lower animal intelligence. Now to the Gnostics, this is what makes the, the Old Testament God fraudulent. So when Paul comes along and in Paul's doctrine, we see that this same mind is in Paul's doctrine because the invention of God the Father is an invention to undo what the, the creator God of the Old Testament uh, would not do. And the God of the Old Testament would not touch sin and, and albeit the, uh, the main problem to the, the, the God of the Old Testament is not human sin. The God of the Old Testament has no problem with his congregation killing and committing sin to get his people the land that they need to get. Sin is not on human sin, as we would, as we would today think of it in a Roman and a Greek sense, was not on the mind of that God. What was on the mind of that God was, was sin framed according to commandments. So, so long as you broke the commandments of God, you were a sinner. That's all that mattered to this God was worship me for the good that I'm doing for you so that you can receive the blessing for the service and the statement of your worship toward me. Natural sin was not the issue because natural sin to this God's mind is supposed to be used as a tool to reform the human being. With sin, with, within the human being naturally, with the human being's natural fracture, the idea of the natural fracture is supposed to be a philosophical cause for the person to actually understand who they are as a, as a person. So you're actually taking the fracture and you're, 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 you're turning it upside down to where you can receive wisdom from it. And this wisdom from that fracture is what is supposed to allow the individual to understand that they are a creation and that the creator made no mistake because I cannot know what is within me and I cannot know that I'm a creation unless I know that I'm faulty and I go through the experience of, of years of debauchery, and then if, if, if by chance, and if I will, to understand that those years um, have, have caused a bit of a damage to my personality, to my intelligence, and to my sense of love and being, that I, I, I can now willingly understand the reform I need to make to turn more to my creator for a conversation that is worthwhile. So sin, Natural sin, as we, would, as we would think of it in our present society and in Roman sense and in Greek sense, which is our present society, this isn't, this isn't the culture of the Old Testament. The, the, the scheme of Paul, when it comes to God the Father, now God the Father has an intention by sending his logos into this one, this one individual, and that intention is to conquer the sin that the Old Testament God does not want to. This, 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 this actually overrides the philosophy of that former age. And Paul is admitting a new philosophy. He's admitting a new philosophy of the labor of the Logos. God the Logos. Logos is God. God the Logos within the virtuous sufferer. And by doing so, by dying and rising within this body, a cosmic shift is taking place. And the cosmic shift being, because that which is within the man cannot die, rising with him evidently because it cannot kill him because it's, it's mixed with him, there's now a cosmic shift and God has made things right with the human essence. So now due to that logos working within that virtuous servant, mankind and humanity now has a free pardon of sins. Mankind now has um, a sure form of righteousness before the Father. And mankind now has you know, the opportunity to reconcile with the Logos for the gifts emanating from his spirit, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. 
but but the, there's a twist. The twist is that this wasn't done for anyone else um, but that man. In Paul's philosophy, this purging of sin um, was not done for anyone else besides that man. That man has no sin within him because the cosmic shift has allowed that to take place. Now that cosmic shift did not take place within anyone else. No one at that time, at this time, because of that sacrifice of the Logos, is clear and covered. No one. In Paul's theology, in order to be cleared and covered, you have to then join to the congregation, to the spiritual congregation, up to where that now demigod has risen up to. And he's risen up to be the high priest at the Father's right hand for humanity's advocate. So if you are not joined to the advocate's congregation, spiritual priesthood, which Paul now goes on to say is the kingdom of God now, if you're not joined to that community, well, then you, you have no, you're, you're done. God has done nothing for you. God has done nothing for you, and you're wasting your time even breathing. And what Paul is doing here is, is he's doing something very Stoic. The Stoics have a belief in their philosophy that everyone is joined to a divine community. What Paul is doing, Paul is establishing a divine community for a specific group of people. And here's how he's doing it. He's doing it through the logic of that virtuous sufferer. This was not a Greek person. This was not an, a, a person out there. This was, this was somebody within the camp of Israel. For the supposed God of the Jews to see a Jew living the philosophical lifestyle of a Greek and of a Gentile and accepting this so much that he gave his spirit into that individual to fulfill a work within that individual. Well, then if, if a Jew is doing the, the philosophical lifestyle of a Greek and is being accepted, this now means that the Gentiles have a right into the camp of Israel through this same pattern and laws are no longer needed to justify them as Jews. So this is very elaborate. This is very elaborate because Paul is now trying to make the Jewish religion popular well, from a Hellenistic point of view. <coughs> and he's, he's, he's doing it successfully. Because this is a, this is a, a great argument that a, a Jew is living, this is a Greek lifestyle. The lifestyle of the Stoic, the lifestyle of the Cynic, is the lifestyle of the suffering, virtuous servant. Suffering virtuously is what is held in high regard to this society. And to see a Jew living this lifestyle, and so much so that he is accepted, that he's given the logos, and by having the logos within him, he's, he's, he's allowed to do the whole, to, to, to live with the Holy Spirit, to, the Holy Ghost, and to perform certain works. But Paul let us know that when the Holy Ghost is within, Romans 5, the love of God is spread abroad by the Holy Ghost. So Paul is, is sectioning out a philosophical community to have, as he says, the mind of his Christ. And the mind of his Christ is the virtuous sufferer for love. Now, as the Logos suffered for the Father, there is no more need to suffer for the Father. There is now a need to suffer for the Logos. Remember, God is Logos to Paul. There is God and the Father and Jesus Christ. As the Logos suffered for the Father, in this spiritual community, you now need to suffer for the Logos. The Logos is the Son of God. Paul does not see the demigod as the Son of God, as the Son of the Father. The demigod is the Son of the Logos. By, by that 
unnatural insemination, whatever you want to call it, the release of his spirit, with the release of the spirit of the Logos within the virtuous sufferer. So Paul is creating a community, a specific philosophical Jewish Greek community for individuals to maintain what I like to call, what I have been calling in my research, <clears throat> the Messiah lifestyle. Now the Messiah lifestyle is suffering virtuously for the cause of the Logos. And the cause of the Logos is the cause of love toward the Father and love toward mankind. So in this community, if you are maintaining the Messiah lifestyle, you have all of the gifts shared with your high priest to you. Which is why he says in the, to the Ephesians, you know, blessings to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has shared with us spiritual blessings in heavenly places. These heavenly places, this is a key term in, in, in the King James Version, this word places is italicized because it is in reference to the sanctuary, the two places of the sanctuary. And in Paul's mythology, the demigod was raised and, and now became the high priest at the right hand of God on behalf of human sinners. And so once you are joined to this community, now you have free righteousness. Now you have free reconciliation to the Logos for the purpose of receiving the Holy Ghost so that now the love of the Logos can emanate from you and you can maintain the Messiah lifestyle. It is the maintaining of the Messiah lifestyle, and this is where Paul's message gets apocalyptic, it is the maintaining of the, of the Messiah lifestyle that he says in the Ephesians, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. So if you're not willing to maintain this lifestyle under this spiritual community, you are not going to be resurrected at the day of redemption or on that day at that time. So Paul is putting a cap on this experience, this philosophical experience, because he says, um, in, to the Corinthians, you know, they run this race for something that is flesh-based, but we run this race for something that is eternal and not corruptible. And then that would have the mastery are temperate in all things. So through his, through his philosophical community now, based off of the ideal model of the demigod or the logos exercising himself within the virtuous sufferer, Paul is forwarding Stoic philosophy of virtue, of discipline, of self-denial for the purpose, and of temperance, for the purpose of virtue. And he's doing all of this because it is the virtuous, the virtuous that maintain the Messiah lifestyle in the way that they're supposed to maintain it, that will be accounted worthy of the resurrection at that day. So what Paul is, 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 is saying in his, you know, mythology and theology, this is not what we know today. It is not what we know today. Paul wants a community of, of, of individuals willing to live the, the Messiah lifestyle so that they can have the same experience his Messiah had. That's why he teaches the goal is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The, the, the point is you're living this lifestyle and you're living this lifestyle to have the same experience of wholeness and of virtue that that individual experienced with the same tools so that you too can receive the same resurrection at the same, at, at a time just like him, and to be where he is. So Paul is, 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 is trying to maintain Jewish thought, but he's also truly wanting to entertain uh, Greek philosophical thought because it is this community and only this community that has their sins forgiven. It's only this community joined to the spiritual uh, congregation that is now above, that has uh, direct reconciliation to the Logos for this experience in the Messiah lifestyle. No one else in the world has this. If you are outside of this, 
you are still sin bound and cannot be resurrected. You are still sin bound and your life is pointless. If you do not have this community and are not joined to it, well, then you're just wasting your time. Because it is through the logos that the Father has, at the appointed time, decided to call all things through him. So that by his um, you know, death, you may be reconciled into the body of his flesh to be considered holy and unblameable and worthy of that period of time in the future. All of this is, is, is resting within that one individual. There is no sin taken away from anyone else. There is, there is nothing taken away from anyone else to make them any better than the God of the Old Testament made them. And there is nothing that you can do that Moses gave you that can allow you to be and to have the status of what I am now telling you you can have by this one, by this, by 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 what the, the demigod did. And in Paul's philosophy, it is the work of the Son of the Father that he highlights as being important and as being praised. He doesn't call his Jesus the Son of God because he's not. This is not the Son of God. The Son of God is the Logos, the one that actually came from the Father. And it is because of the Logos, and this is where he says, God humbled himself to find himself as a man, as a servant, in the likeness of men, and so much so that he willingly pledged himself unto death and to the death of the cross. He's not talking about, as we would think in these present times, due to our now misunderstanding of, of the Bible, of what Paul is teaching. He's not talking about his Jesus. His Jesus is not the Jesus of Christianity that, that exists um, in that religion. Paul's Jesus is a man infused with the Logos. And it was the Logos that humbled himself to enter into the form of a man and to die the death of the cross. It is the Logos that did this, the Son of God. So Paul's ideology is, is very different uh, from us today, or should I say not us, from the Christian religion today, because his ideology is based on the work of God the Father and God the Logos. And I have to also say this, bearing in mind, this is all imaginary. <laughs> This is all imaginary. This is all coming from Paul's imagination. Paul is building off of an already established framework philosophically. He's taking an already existing character and he's adding on pieces and elements of Greek philosophical thought to him, creating his Jesus Christ. This is an invented figure along with his God the Father. This is all invented. I'm just saying that so we can keep that in mind. Um, because that's important. Before you continue, yeah, we have a super chat question. Sure. Consolation Pegasus, thank you for your super chat. He says there were 12 apostles. Where are the other eight in the Bible? The narrative drops off. And if you, it, I'll just give you an illustration of that. Um, in the, the book of Acts begins with chosen apostles. <clears throat> the book of Acts begins with chosen apostles. These chosen apostles ask their questions to their, their personage, and then they see their personage um, taken up into heaven. <clears throat> These apostles that see their personage taken up into heaven, they then join an upper room where the Bible tells us, where the author of the book of Acts tells us, is Peter, James, John, and the crew. That's weird. And I don't think... Um, that's so easily caught on to because we naturally assume that the ones that saw him taken up uh, were Peter, John, James, Bartholomew, Thomas, and that crew. But the book of Acts starts differently. The narrative is different. The narrative in the book of Acts starts with the apostles seeing their personage go up, and then those apostles 
join not what is called the apostles in the upper room, but the name shifts. Peter, John, and James are now called the disciples in the upper room. So you have the apostles beginning the book of Acts, and then you have the disciples, Peter, John, James, Bartholomew, and such with the mothers in the upper room. So I'm saying this because there's a narrative shift. And the characters that are in these narratives, they are not the, char the characters that, that we would associate as we're reading these narratives. The authors don't really care about uh, the characters besides the, the point of what they're trying to push forward. So the characters fall off, most definitely. The characters um, fall off and the characters are replaced just as you would think as the book of Luke ends with Simon and the other disciples seeing him go up. And then you think that now the, the book of Acts continues that, it actually doesn't. Because the apostles that see him in the book of Acts go up, they're joining the disciples that are supposedly um, have seen him already go up. <laughs> so the, the whole uh, disciples, these authors are not concerned with consistency or history. These authors are concerned with pushing a general agenda and that general agenda being to promote um, their specific religious philosophical thought. So when it comes to that, that's, that's really what I would say because there's a lot of inconsistencies that we really don't pick up on that we're not supposed to pick up on, but that are there and that the authors, they don't really, they don't really care about. Ho hopefully that, that's all right. Should I, should I I'll, I'll pick up um, where I last Yeah, off. that's fine. You can uh, pick up where you left off earlier. Okay. Um, so you've got Paul on the one hand who is creating a, a community and he's justifying the creation of this community and him as the Gentile apostle to the, to the Gentiles because he is formulating a theory of um, a Jew living the lifestyle of a Greek, the virtuous sufferer, being accepted by a supposed Jewish God and receiving that anointing and then maintaining a lifestyle for it. And so to, to Paul, he's calling now Gentiles by this illustration to himself. Because if this is the case, that a Jew is living a Greek lifestyle, why now must a Gentile live the lifestyle of a Jew? If circumcision is actually necessary, you know, even though he was a Jew, why didn't this anointing come into him at another time for another season? Why wasn't this, you know, why wasn't it framed in, in, in the way that it was supposed to be framed if, if this was strictly for a Jew? But you have a Jew living a, a Greek Gentile lifestyle. And so, yes, you are supposed to be in this community of what he terms the Bible calls his gospel, what he terms my, his, his gospel, what he says is my gospel. And my gospel is, is that so long as you were joined to this community of the now um, dying and rising son of the Logos, you have given to you the righteousness that you continually fight for through rituals and sacrifices given to you by Moses freely. You now have uh, the pardon that you continually fight for through what Moses gave you from, from your sins freely. And you now have a perpetual reconciliation to the Logos, meaning that you now have the emanating spirit of the Logos as a tool and as an instrument for you to maintain the type of lifestyle you need to maintain in order to be elected for that specific day of atonement. And so Paul is, 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 is really doing a thing here where he is getting on the route of, well, you don't really need, the Jewish laws really aren't needed for this because this is now all about faith and what the Logos did in the man's body. So, so long as you can have faith in what the Logos did in the man's body for you, 
and you can consecrate yourself to this community, well then you are just as without as much sin as that same now um, dying and rising, ascending and ordained son of the Logos. And again, that really in reality makes no sense when you get down to the, to the, to the, to the, the final points of that, but that doesn't, that doesn't matter. What matters is the spiritual context of it because it's due to association. It's due to association, one, and two, it's due to you maintaining that lifestyle, the Messiah lifestyle, of which you will receive all power and credit for to maintain so long as you keep the mind of Christ and the mind of Christ being a mind of exercised love. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, for Christ not only did the same, but suffered reproach upon himself. This is Galatians 15, uh, sorry, Romans 15. So Paul is, is initiating a community that is quite stoic and quite cynic, except while they have no goal, while they're just running this race for something that's flesh-based, we're actually running this race due to God the Father and due to the work of the Logos for something immutable and for something eternal. And so long as you are in this community, you have to be in this community. This is the community you have to be in. Because in order to serve God, you have to have no sins. And in order to properly maintain the Messiah lifestyle, you have to have the, the power of the Holy Spirit, of which can only come from the Logos. So if you're in this community, you have all the tools that Moses cannot give you, that no one can give you for the righteousness you're looking for and for the hope of the resurrection that you're looking for. And so he's getting away from traditional Jewish thought of where the laws of Moses are necessary for where any law of religion is necessary into an exercise of an assumed hope due to an association that is also assumed of a labor of which force has to be imagined of receiving to continue in, in order to have your name figuratively etched into the sealing cases on the day of redemption. And he goes on and elaborates more about why these laws are not really that necessary. And he does so in, in what I believe is correct fashion. He does so by saying in the book of Galatians 3, uh, 11, 12, 13, that the body of the man that was crucified should not be looked at as a real human body. Because Moses said, he that is hanged is the curse of God. Now, if we're going to take this body as being, and this is where I'm saying that there are two, there are different Pauls here, and that there are different uh, doctrines of Paul that deviate, this is the deviation. Because while the first Paul that I spoke about um, is, is the Paul of honoring the, the body that died and that rose and consecrating yourself to it, as in idolizing it, now you have the Paul in Galatians saying that Moses said that the, the body that's hanged is worthless and is accursed. So if you're going to look at this body as a physical sacrifice of your personal salvation, um, this body is really of no use to you. Because if you're believing in the same God as me, God says that that, uh, that hanged body is, is accursed. And what God curses is cursed. There's no salvation in it. So taking that body to then be your form of salvation is actually uh, worthless, which the other Paul says is worthwhile. So two, two different Pauls here. But as opposed to looking at that body as being a physical body uh, for your salvation, you actually need to look at that body as what it really represents because God would not allow this individual to die if he was so precious for no reason. And so what Paul does is Paul takes what Moses says and then refines it by saying that that man's body does not represent and should not represent a physical body. It should instead represent a philosophy. 
And the philosophy that Paul associates that body with is the philosophy of the religious law. The philosophy of the religious law is, the, is a philosophy where you, by doing deeds and acts, are righteous to the divine eye. That is the philosophy of the religious law, and it is the foundation of all Jewish-based religions, including the Christian. And the analogy of all of this is that because that body is crucified, and because that body represents the standard of Jewish philosophy, of, of favor, of righteousness, of pardon, and piety to the divine eye, well, the crucifixion of that body means the crucifixion of, 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 of the religious law and its standard and of its value. With the religious law um, figuratively illustrated through this man's body, seeing this man's body crucified again, the religious law is now of no value because God has accursed it. So seeing this man hanged, we shouldn't take him as literally being there because even though he is there, God isn't like us as human. And so what God may attribute to something happening may not be attributed in a human natural sense. So with that being said, we now have to look at this. This is Paul from the standpoint of what God is looking at this as. And God is looking at this, not from a physical standpoint, but from a mental and philosophical. And what this body represents is a body of knowledge concerning the Jews' devotion to righteousness. Righteousness by religious laws, deeds, baptisms, rites, circumcisions, feasts, holy days, so on and so forth. To see this body crucified is to see that crucified. And then he goes on in, in other places, uh, Romans, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the strength of sin is the law. It is now understood that the religious law is the definition of sin. And this is correct because the entire theme throughout the Bible from Genesis to Malachi is this very fact. There are two philosophies within the Bible. <clears throat> the first philosophy is a religion that is led by religious laws and doing them for the feeling of devotion and for the feeling of consecration. Uh, the second philosophy from Genesis to Malachi is the exercising of the mind for an inward experience to refine the human being. The issue at the crucifixion exposed the fraudulent uh, philosophy from the beginning of time up until that point, and Paul brought that out. The fraudulent philosophy is a, fraud, is, is, a, is, a, is a religion based off of doing deeds and acts for a feeling of piety, for a feeling of decency, for a thought of awareness of your own belief through doing something physical, your human being engaging yourself. This is, this is simply the uh, traditional religion is simply a human experience deceiving itself as a spiritual occurrence. To the Bible's mind, this is sin. To see that man crucified highlights this point. And this is what Paul is trying to get across and does perfectly. With this now being seen as sin, that means that there is another lifestyle for us to live. And this is where Romans comes in. Um, be re, we, the, we, we spent our time in, in the death of the motions of sin through the law, but now we are, we are rescued from it. And this is what he says in Galatians, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So in Galatians 1, he says, uh, Christ has saved us from our sins. Galatians 3, Christ has redeemed us from the law. Now the Paul of the Galatians is associating sin with the religious law and is not associating sin with what that other Paul I first talked about is associating sin as. So the Paul forming his cult around uh, the idol demigod for maintaining the Stoic and sinning lifestyle for the purpose of receiving a credit to be resurrected at the day of redemption, sin is natural. Sin is what we would today regard as sin naturally. What religion tells us sin is, that's what that Paul counts as sin and what prevents the individual from being resurrected at that time. The Paul of the Galatians, uh, the Paul of the Corinthians, and, and mixed in with the Paul of the Romans is that sin 
is the philosophy of the religious law. With sin being the philosophy of the religious law, there is now a newness that the individual has to carry themselves by. And, and so the illustration of if that spirit raised Jesus by his spirit, so too that same spirit will raise us up and the connotation not being in the future, the connotation being present at, at right now. And this again, the book of Romans um, from Galatians takes and shifts back to the cult, community cult that Paul is forming where the individual has to now no longer rely and see the law as cursed, having everything, the experience fulfilled um, by the mind of Christ. Romans 13, the love is the fulfilling of the law. And so the Logos doing what he did through that uh, suffering servant honored what the Jews would say is the, is, is the entire law, which is love to God, the Father, and then love to mankind. So if you are joined to this community, and if you are exercising faith on the, the individual that has the logos, who is the son of God, within the high priest of its spiritual congregation, which is the demigod, son of the logos, then you now have everything that Moses could not do for you, but that is freely done for you the only thing you have to do now is maintain the Messiah lifestyle. Maintain the same lifestyle that that first person did in order to receive acknowledgement from the Father and for the entrance of the Logos within him to have unsealed within, within him the spirit of the Logos, which is the Holy Ghost, to continue to maintain the mind of Christ. And, and doing so, and needing to do so, because if you are not, well then everything that the Logos did does not account for you. And if you are honoring the law, Galatians 5, well then you're really just blaspheming um, the act of the Logos. And in Galatians 2, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So Paul has a multitude of arguments and there are different, different Pauls going back to the Paul of the book of Acts, who is harassed, uh, we are told, um, by a sorcerer, 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 and his prophetess, who's saying out loud that this is Paul, the servant of the Most High God, who is showing us the way of salvation. And what was Paul's reaction? Paul's reaction was, he was angry at that. He was angry at what they were saying. When in reality, you should think that that commendation should have been received as, as if Peter or John heard it in the same book. They don't respond angrily as Paul did because Paul is not teaching or Paul is not educating on the way of salvation, that, that, that initial Jesus movement that um, the, the Damascus priests built their framework on, and then Paul built his framework off of the Damascus priests, that initial movement taught what is called the way. The way, they taught the way. And the way had to do with looking at this individual's supposed resurrection as being for salvation. As the psalm says, he that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. The true form of salvation comes from putting the conversation in order. That means that there is an inward work that the human being has to do in relation to the philosophy and to the wisdom that is within the scriptures on a daily basis. Salvation at the core of the Bible has everything to do with mental deliverance and inward alleviation. That's salvation, plain and simple. It has nothing to do with uh, belief in the blood of a demigod. It has nothing to do with um, re residing yourself in a community of the Messiah lifestyle. Everything within the Bible concerning salvation is mental uh, alleviation and spiritual rejuvenation from former religious error. 
and former religious error to the mind of the Bible is a religion that is guided by religious laws. So the resurrection of sorts is supposed to take place within the conversation, within the person moving away from religious laws and then allowing the conversation to gain an experience of understanding for wisdom through applying themselves to the scriptures on a daily basis for knowledge to live by. So this is creation. This is the new covenant promise that the book of Jeremiah talks about is that I will write in their hearts and in their minds my law. And this law, because the author speaking is not Moses, the author speaking is the God of uh, Jeremiah, this law is a specific philosophy that you find in the book of John where it says, I know him and keep his saying. This, this law is, is a saying concerning the conversation's deliverance from false religion into a personal experience. That's the controversy within the scriptures and Paul entering into the fray, building off of an already established framework and having the character of Balaam uh, assigned to him and having the same hate for the Jesus movement, for the then, that then Jesus movement as, as Herod, supposedly Herod, and Balaam being associated as a false prophet, well, Paul is, is really um, making a mess of the initial Jesus movement by bringing Greek philosophical thought into it. And he's doing so, um, I want to say, could be wrong, but although brought to deceive, which I believe, he got so into what he was doing mentally, he got so hyped by his own invention that you can actually find him going off of the cuff writing to these ministers in um, the Philippians and in the Thessalonians trying to explain his theory. And this is where his philosophy and where he says so much you know, comes out. He's just going off of the cuff. The infection that he posed was an infection of, of, of taking on what the initial Jewish movement would not, and doing so in a Greek uh, philosophical frame of mind. Innocent as that may be, um, it was nonetheless devastating because it ruined what that initial movement had planned. But then again, Paul's initial movement was ruined because Christianity, as we know it today, fought. <laughs> um, and it's led me to believe that although Paul may have given this framework, Paul is not the actual mind. He may be the, the he, he may be something, but Christianity today, when it comes to that Trinity, that's not Paul's theology. Paul's not the father of that. Paul's theology and Paul's mythology involves only two gods, God the Father and God the Logos. God the Logos being God the Son. That's all that matters to Paul. The next thing that matters to Paul is the concept of the virtuous sufferer. Observing the virtuous sufferer, which, is, which he would know is famous, uh, a, a famous Greek lifestyle, and it is stoic, it's cynic. People are doing this. He's seeing this in the scriptures and it is justified all throughout, a broken heart and a broken spirit, the Lord will not reject. All throughout the scriptures, this, the, the philosophy of the virtuous sufferer is there and, and Paul is seeing this. And he's associating this to, with his Greek mind, what ought to be. And building off of an already existing framework, he is inventing a Jesus Christ and a God the Father. And he is also inventing emanations from them and a theology and a mythology that goes along with it. And it's quite interesting. Because it has, if we had to look at it today, nothing to do. Uh, with Christianity. The main goal that Paul wanted, it seems, uh, from my research, is that Paul wanted to create a, a Jewish Stoic community to where, and when I say Stoic, I'm not saying immediately Stoic, I'm saying in the same sense, to where both Jews and Greeks, um, under the banner of his Jesus Christ, under the banner of 
the, the, the gift given to them by the Son of God, who is not Jesus Christ, who is the Logos. They can have everything that Moses could not give to them, but the only thing that they have to do is to maintain the Messiah lifestyle. That's, that's, that's your only work. Your only work is to maintain the Messiah lifestyle, and the Messiah lifestyle is to maintain the labor of the Logos. The Logos cared for the will of the Father. We don't have to worry about that will anymore. That's done. What we have to worry about now is the will of the Logos, the will of God, the Logos. God, the Logos, the Son of the Father. And that will is a, a will of love for the Father, a will of love for mankind. And so you'll find Paul in his speeches presenting himself as a Messiah figure. You have, you have heard and have, and, have, and have witnessed the things that have fallen out unto me, and I promise that they are for the furtherance of the gospel, for whether it be of good or whether it be of, equal, of evil, whether or not what is said, it is said to the glory of the gospel. In sufferings, in infirmities, in desecrations, in nakedness, in pores, in being poor, in suffering, I will do nothing but rather glory in my infirmities. Paul is, 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 is believing his own imaginary philosophy. And this imaginary philosophy he is living out and he's demonstrating for the purpose of, of, of gaining individuals to his community for the purpose of spreading his philosophy. And that philosophy of being Jew and Gentile due to the accepted lifestyle that the father took on that individual suffering virtuously can attain to resurrection without the law. You only have to maintain the Messiah lifestyle. Maintain the Messiah lifestyle. But not everybody is, 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 is this isn't for everybody because although the cosmic shift happened, although God the Logos labored within the virtuous servant, reconciling the world unto the Father, unto himself, not imputing their iniquities and sins unto them. Although the cosmic shift happened, the cosmic shift only matters so long as you are in this community. Only this community is gifted the gift of what the Logos did. And so Paul is creating a community of a lifestyle that is philosophical and that is, and that is based off of self-denial, um, discipline, temperance for the purpose of receiving the type of virtue worthy of receiving uh, resurrection on that day of redemption. That's not Christianity. And that's not, it may be, but the scheme of that is not Christianity. The frame of that, um, as much as Paul perverted the initial Jesus movement, that Christianity perverted Paul's perversion. <laughs> um, and that's when I say that Paul you know, is an interesting character and very complex, and that there are multiple Pauls that are given to us. And I believe that there are individuals writing um, in the name of Paul what he may have believed, because there's no one consistent degree of understanding for what Paul is and what Paul is trying to say in, in, in his letters. Even he doesn't have a, a full understanding of the full scope of what's going on. But all he knows is that a Jew lived the lifestyle of a Greek, was anointed. And picking up the framework of the Jesus movement, well, this person was resurrected because he, he lived that virtuous lifestyle. And being resurrected and living that virtuous lifestyle, he must now be a cause and an advocate for that lifestyle and for the people that are living it. And so he must be there in a special way to present his blood to God, making him a high priest for humanity down below. Keep in mind, again, all of this is an invention and is from Paul's imagination. And it is all for the purpose of securing to the Father, as he says in Titus, as he says in Titus, that we should live soberly, justly, and godly at this present time, looking forward and hoping for that good hope that we may be made and then at the day of redemption also taken into a peculiar priesthood. So Paul's looking to establish a community 
stoic in nature, cynic in nature, but that kind of, you know, transcends that because they have the logos on their side and the emanations from the logos for the purpose of sealing them for a resurrection that is not in those philosophical groups. So Paul is wanting to section out a community for a spiritual Eden and only for the purpose of receiving the gifts that Moses could not give them. So, you know, I wanted to just, I left here the last time I was with you and I didn't get to touch on Paul. So I figured, you know, I, I wanna, wanna touch back on Paul because Bible scholars, they're not, they're not doing Paul justice by remaining in their hermeneutical way of studying the Bible. The, the ultimate philosophy of fall is not being understood or spoken about. We don't know it. But what I've just spoken, what I've just, what I've just told you, that is the founding philosophy of what Paul taught. And this character of Paul in engaging his philosophy will allow us to know more about you know, the historicity of him. Because I believe the book of Acts, the author of the book of Acts, subtly, by using illustrations uh, portrayed to him and connections, and he's deviating from the, 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 the passive character of his, of his guide. He's, he's adopting the, the character of Herod. You know, this, this, he's got the, the vision and the experience of Balaam associated to him. The author, of book, the author of the book of Acts knows that he is a false prophet. And he is. He is. Everything that he's giving to us is built, again, off of a framework, of an already is existing framework taken from an already existing framework. <laughs> and it's his imagination that's just going off and ruining that, that initial Jewish movement rewriting the mythology of that movement and is creating a new pantheon and is doing something absolutely contrary to, to what the actual philosophy of the Bible states, which is he is transforming his Jesus Christ into a religious law and to the Bible's mind, at the core of the Bible's philosophy, the religious law is the definition of sin. So he's actually bringing individuals into sin that the Bible says is sin, but he's actually saying it is not. And that's why, you know, I wanted to just touch back on to Paul because I love um, his frame of mind and his theology as imaginary as it is, as built on a framework as it is, uh, it is, it is interesting for the time that he lived in. Well, thanks for joining me today, Lemwood. Thank yeah, thank you for having me. I, I wanted to really just touch back on Paul because Bible scholars are not doing the justice to the Bible hmm. that need that needs to be done. And I, I say this all the time is that the hermeneutical way of studying the scriptures is really putting a damper on how we maintain um, understanding what these things were. Scholars of the Bible are really just in a they're not having the leverage that they need to have because their own limitation is set by the way they studied the Bible. So I wanted to just come back on here and to just talk about the Paul from the Bible. Um, although there are, you know, scholarly things that can be taken from that, my study, my research is strictly based on, on Bible. And I, and I, I study this, um, According to the way that the Bible would have it, it, it gives instruction, but eh, it doesn't matter. But it's it's getting to the root of that cause and, and the effect that I wanted to just touch on when it comes to Paul. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.